pretty. Much, I mean, maybe if you use system deboot, you know. <laughs> we, had, we had a pretty um, I think so. substantial I think PDPH sure. point of sale system running on it. Wow. Sure. 4K. Ryan's going to call me a 4K everywhere except Connecticut. Yeah, exactly. Connecticut and Like I said, you can't get a boot motor in Connecticut. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, 4K words. There were 12 bit words. Oh, okay. 8K well, in Connecticut because sure. Connecticut actually had to have two separate sales taxes. They had meals tax and they had sales tax, depending on the menu item. To the lot. Some menu items came under sales tax and not under meals tax. So. Start the uh, thing. This is a very useful puzzle to have here. Eventually, but uh, not until everyone signed it. Yeah. Not just the people in the room now, but also the people who come I in saw later. this funny picture. It was like one of those memes. And uh, it had a picture of Joseph Stalin. And uh, on the top it said, it, uh, in state socialism, state crushes you. State, the state smashes you. In libertarian socialism, you smash the state. Or something like that. And, uh, that Instead of it being like wzlx.com, 
it's uh, wzlx.cbslocal.com. And so all the all the previous pages, like the links don't work and, and all that. So um, with what is it? So with WROR, luckily they still have the same uh, format that they had, um, just that they moved to WordPress. So the, the kind of um, the folder structure is kind of uh, predictable. <laughs> So not only is he making himself late for this presentation, but he's going to make me late, too. Mm -hmm. No, I, those other guys went downstairs to me. He, he hasn't called yet, though. <laughs> Does he know your number? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever so, you want me to... Do. So Brian's up first? No, uh, he, he's just... Um, uh, I, he's going to set up a bunch of stuff probably over here, maybe. I'm I'm up first, but we'll uh, we'll give him a little more. We'll give him ten minutes. Oh, we'll give him the MIT. Uh, it's ten minutes of the MIT Delta, right? Right. The MIT Delta. Hmm? Isn't that that or the MIT uh, student? I went to Tulane. Work was a little different. It's like thirty minutes down there. It was fifteen minutes for a professor. Um, Five minutes for an instructor. Sounds fun. Something like that. And the dress code. Oh, okay. cool. So we get two more. Dress code was t shirts and cutoffs. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, take that back row. Hazing and fraternities were, you had to wear a suit and tie in a fraternity. That was hazing. Oh, no, New Orleans, no, that's hazing. That's right. right. It really is hazing. This was in the 60s. You put it right down there. Yes. So I graduated to Lane in. Uh, that's my suit. Six. Do you mind if I move in here? That's fine. What are you doing? I know you're. Well, just um, well, I'm starting because I I'm talking on a actually I'm a good segue to you. I'm doing doing the yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, <laughs> this is Meteor up there. This is Meteor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he made it by two minutes. Uh, this, is, this is Ambrose. He's going to help the solar that panda cluster in the corner. Uh, there's. I got. I got. I brought my own batteries. Okay, there's a plug down. Can you get your batteries on your car drives outside? So, um, well, we can do any order you want. Do you want to be last? If you want to be last, but we can just go. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. It, it is, yes. And we'll have, we'll have documentary eyes. I just started parking. So guys, we're gonna probably go. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, we can switch anyway. Uh, I should be able to give me a bonding so I got previously attached to the owner of the story. 
So the August meeting will be at 8 o'clock unless I hear some objections online. Um, secondly, is anybody going to go to the Cambridge Brewery after the meeting? Okay, one, two, three, four. Yeah, we've got at least four of us. I have to drive so because I'm uh, hauling Jabber and his stuff today. So I'll make the announcement before we break uh, around 9, 9-ish, 9 9.30-ish. They close their kitchen at 10 o'clock, so we have to be cognizant of that, but I don't want to steal anyone's steam over here. If you go, if you go on late, that's fine with me. We'll just skip the brewery. Okay, Kurt? Okay. We all know Kurt. That's right, and if you don't know me, we don't care about I am now one more into the longest lived speaker at BLU than Christoph Dorbach, <laughs> who is my arch enemy. I bet he's just, I bet he's really pissed that he uh, had to uh, cancel last time, this time yeah. back in March. And he'll never speak here again. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Oh, is that what you're hoping? Anyway. So, so this is sort of like. Uh, Steve Martin and that other guy on Saturday Night Live. Yes. Oh, Alec Baldwin, Baldwin, yeah. Should wear that bathrobe oh. with the big five. Yeah, right? oh, we can no, the big thing was between Steve meeting Martin and uh, Alec Baldwin. Meeting, ah, we could. We could. So, we, so ne next time he comes, we'll have to get you a nice big roll of carpet. Yes. 
Oh, and a five timer jacket. <laughs> yes, big five. So, so we're running out of names for uh, meetings at BLU because we've been around so long. I, I blame Jerry and Jack for that. But so that's why we have all these clever names like like Quick Hit Redux. Yeah, it's all um, our fault for failing to disband the group. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then at the very last minute, like about an hour ago, I found out that that, uh, that Brian's project is called Ronin Two. So I said, well, I have to do Ronin One, but I misspelled it anyway. So. <laughs> Well, not necessarily. But it's it, uh, Japanese. Ah, hold that thought. Wow. <laughs> so there's two different Ronins. There's a Japanese one, and there's a guy from Marvel Comics. And I think they spell them differently. Well, I'm not, not really sure. Of it. <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, auto advance. If only I knew how to turn that off. Um, so we've done three major solar-powered supercomputing projects here. For some of you, you graybeards like Sohan, who were around in 2007 for the first one. We, I know this is 2007 because in the background there you can see one of the solar panels that we took off the solar house. Where's Amber? So, so we have these wonderful donated solar panels back when it was, I don't know, <coughs> 10 bucks a watt for a solar panel back in 2007. Insane bucks. So. And then we have this big pile of Shiva plugs. So the problem with the Shiva plug cluster is, um, well, one of the problems was, this was early in the ARM chip revolution. So, so you could get an ARM chip that would do for you what it does in the Raspberry Pi. It's like an ARM 7 or an ARM 9. Not great for floating point math. So to build a supercomputer out of Raspberry Pis, yeah, you can get some nice blinking lights, but you're not gonna get a whole lot of math. Not a whole lot of, uh, I triple approved standard <coughs> 754 2008 uh, floating point math out of it. And you gotta have that if you want the rest of the world to call it a supercomputer. You can call it a supercomputer, but if you're not doing floating point math on it, it's not. There's nothing wrong. wrong with integer math. So, well, I know. I just, you wanna do prime numbers, you just ask. Do big in. Yeah, the Bing, the Bing data cent uh, center apparently does integer math and, and half precision. So, so I think this was 2007, just because of the, and we did this out here. We'll, we'll probably never do another solar-powered supercomputer on the porch of E51 <laughs> because of the parking situation and the perma construction that's going on around here. So yeah, yeah, maybe they'll finish the construction oh, in 20 yeah, years or so, and they can do it then. Two seasons, winter and construction, or three seasons: summer, winter, and construction. So we coupled this with NASA has this tech briefs competition, and in 2011. We worked with guys like Ambrose to put together some really clever, wicked cheap uh, concentrated photovoltaic solutions. So uh, your garden variety photovoltaic will take as many suns as you want to put into it, as long as you can keep it cool. It's kind of like, like an Intel processor. These, <laughs> thing, these things will run at 10 gigahertz if you can keep them cool. So luckily I work at a school that, that people leave liquid nitrogen outside of their doors on a regular basis. <laughs> so, so we were able to keep, I don't know if you can see it there, but that little, the, I'll give you the URL to these sites. So six years ago when we did this, we had, we had this really good Spectra Lab triple junction uh, PV, and you, if you kept it wicked cold, you could, you could take a, a 10x frontal lens and focus on it, and it, and it would give you like crazy output as long as it kept it cold. <laughs> now, unfortunately, sometimes it, instead of the, the power just dropping off, sometimes you'd have a catastrophic failure. And so, so I'll show you some close ups of uh, that little piece of PV. We also had the, um, the truck inner tube that we had a, a little canister on. So, so it was kind of like. Um, uh, the Zodiac uh, boat. You'd, you'd hit the button and you'd stand back, and this thing would pop open. And we had a uh, we had some uh, some uh, shiny material that was also like a Velcro on there, and it, so it would pull par partial pressure. We basically had the, the trough of a, a parabola, so this thing would <coughs> create, create the trough of a parabola, and then we'd set the frontal up about halfway up on a, on a four-legged uh, uh, camera stand. And then we'd kind of mess with it to, uh, to see if we could get it to focus down just enough on both sides of the, uh, of the PV that we could stick in a frontal lens, or excuse me, a prism, 
and split off the UV and the IR so that it would overshoot the PV. So <laughs> thereby keeping it even slightly cooler. <laughs> <laughs> and you know oh, what? Man. This is a great project for NASA Tech Breeze. And so we got, you can see, we got 34 vo votes. So, so you have basically an inflatable telescope. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. And the only thing we couldn't do, and we may revisit some of these issues this year, is figure out some clever way to scrape the web and find out when is a good time to draw the, the, the prism up and down, or maybe the frontal lens up and down. Uh, don't know. Um, and, uh, and, and also put it on, on at, at, at least, at least uh, you know, a seesaw, but possibly a, a, a three-axis mount or something. Don't know. We've got, we certainly have the software for this. Turns out, um, and I, I have a link to this too, maybe I'll show it after the other guys are done so that I know. I'm just gonna tell you the top 80% right now. Um, you can get a, a nice little Linux package to control your mount for a telescope. It's a, it takes an RS-232 and, it, and you punch in to your little script, I wanna record Orion tonight. And so it already knows where you are because you've already all set this up. It's, it's not GPS enabled, but you've already set this up. And then you come back in the morning, and it has, has stepped through and followed Orion across the sky. Um, and that little package is called, um, uh, yeah, it'll come to me, but, uh, but it, we called it the, we called our thing the uh, ephemeris project, because we weren't moving a telescope around, we were moving a, a Yagi antenna around. So we would, we would steal signal from subsequently. You'd love this, because you'd never spend so much time on somebody's Wi-Fi that you got caught. <laughs> and we just moved this, this Yagi antenna. Uh, but it was the same software. So, um, so, so after the Shiva plug, we did the Panda board. And uh, you know, I thank Brian for introducing me to the guy who was in charge, a guy named Jay, who was in charge of Panda board at Texas mm -hmm. Instruments. The Panda board was so far ahead of its time. So mm -hmm. first of all, they went from these ARM7s and ARM9s family of, of uh, processors that you couldn't do much math with to an ARM Cortex-A. So, so ARM, in, in probably one of the dopiest marketing strategies ever, decided that they were gonna have three lines, an A line, an R line, and an M line. And nobody at ARM knows what the difference between these processing classes are. So, the, but ARM Cortex-A, not ARM-A, not ARM-A9, ARM Cortex-A9 was a great dual core processor with SIMD extensions. It was begging to have supercomputing on it. So we got these uh, OMAP fours, which is two ARM Cortex A nines for Texas Instruments. Panda board, um, great rollout. They published the Gerber files for the, for the board, the carrier board. You got the processor on there, and you got a bunch of other cool things. So we wrote like like a dozen papers. And got accepted to to a lot of the Beowulf Center conferences, and um, uh, and I have a better link than that's a link to. Uh, uh, to Brian's video at the bottom, but I have a better link coming up here shortly. Well, in fact, that's where it is. So what we have decided to do this summer with the Nauset School students, which are all mostly over here, and a couple of the MIT students that are, are their TAs, we're going to uh, do three things. One is the arm length thing, which is just take what we got, turn it on, see if we have any slight improvements over the last time we did it, and then we're going to see if we can migrate to, to a, a much better solar powered cluster than what we had five years ago. And then number three would be, what would we do in a perfect world? So, so if you go to this website, you'll find a link to, to how we put it together last time. Two or three of the contributions on the Panda board 48 node cluster was um, carrying both power and data on the same, on the same conductor. Now, that's only recently come into vogue in big data centers because uh, when people were trying to come to an agreement on, on at least an IEEE standard for power over Ethernet or, or an alternative standard, they wanted something that you could expose. You could build a 44U rack out of and have big copper you know, conduits running up the side and not kill people. So that's a tall order. It's like, well, it turns out in, in your garden variety, a uh, six-foot rack. There's, you know, a couple of kilowatts of power in there. There's probably some ways to kill people with that thing, but not with power over Ethernet, because it's it's 48 volts, and I forget what the the amperage limits on it on it are, but you can expose those wires. So that that's that's why power over Ethernet is what it is. 
it's the maximum voltage you can expose bare wires with in, the, in a data center. Now this is, this is probably not building code. This is probably not city of Cambridge build a house, expose 48 volt <laughs> copper, but uh, you can certainly do it in a data center. You can see it all the time. So this is what we're going to, to do. Uh, we're shooting for the weekend of August 11th. We've got most of the panda board gear and a couple of the other balance of materials parts down there. Ed's going to, to run, run the build out down there. And then we're going to, to at least do, we, we think we're going to have a, uh, a proof of concept on, on the AC only version, the one where we bypass the, the, the Adobe you know, AC to DC and then DC to AC conversion and just go straight to the panda boards, which is, which is great. The panda boards are five volts. They'll take anything from, from traditional um, USB, so, so a half, or half an amp, up to, uh, actually I think USB was a quarter of an amp. So, so you can certainly put two amps in it, and I'll show you what we're doing with, with, with the ones that we've got right here. But definitely go to this URL. As you can see, we're not up to 36 votes yet. We've had 95 views, but only three votes. So, so this is entirely a beauty contest. The NASA isn't going to award the best idea with 50,000 bucks. It's just votes. <laughs> so, so you see some pretty crazy uh, people winning the NASA Tech Brief contest. But, um, uh, but if you log in and, and give us a vote, we'd appreciate that. So, this is not uh, a panda board with a couple of our radios on it. This is what we might go to next time. We're very enamored with the with the NVIDIA Jetson because it not only has ARM uh, CPUs in it, but it's got accelerators on the die too. So I think I think we may migrate to um, after we after we do the Panda board, we're going to look at at uh, various Jetson configs. <coughs> so here's a little bit of the background with the uh, ARM uh, supercomputing. Now most of these conferences, these supercomputing conferences, are indoors. And some of the PV we had would actually make juice out of, out of uh, indoor uh, lamps, but generally speaking, they weren't. Uh, at one of the supercomputing conferences, we, we got a, uh, one of our devices outside so that the uh, attendees could go by and see it. Um, and at, at a, a traditional supercomputing conference, the only thing you're really demonstrating there is energy efficiency. No one's really gonna run a computer outside um, but uh, progressively, this is becoming more and more of a, of a thing you could actually do. Uh, so the thing on the left, uh, on my left, is, is the uh, Linux radio flyer that was running off of a car battery. And we had a major power outage that year at Supercomputing, so, so that was the only one that ran the entirety of the show. <laughs> and, then, and, so, and on the right is the uh, gumsticks. Um, OMAP 3, so the, the same same ARM Cortex A8 that's in the Beagle board is on these these gumsticks, uh, and I think you guys remember the gumsticks. Um, and they they stage code boards. We take seven of them, and then we loaded it up. So so we got 192 ARM cores into a big stack of, of those. Um, <coughs> for a while there, we messed with these. Um, do you remember the Socris Geode before AMD bought it? So Geode was a pretty cool chip. And it was, uh, and it goes way back. It probably precedes ARM. Um, the uh, we did the Linux lunchbox. I also have um, the uh, we have the Fawn and the Swan, which were uh, Socrates Geode. Got some pictures of them. We did a uh, we had a bunch of these broken Next machines, and I actually I want to donate one of our broken Next machines to to BLU because someone actually did a Linux port to the Next machine. And it was called. Linux, and, uh, and of course uh, the the password the, the default password was ungnu, Unix not gnu, which is <laughs> not only a palindrome but it's a <laughs> so we had so we had the previous machine. This was me and uh, and a, a guy you guys might remember Kevin from Mount Ida College. So yep. me and him went down. This was when right. supercomputing was in Baltimore, which is the closest it's come to Boston. Was this with the original hardware or, or something else built into the original case? So we, yeah, we yanked the hardware and stuck uh, boards in the case. Yeah, I haven't heard from uh, Kevin in a long time. I know, we should track him down. Because he had a Beowulf bar raising too. But no, yeah, no, are, are you sure you're on the right slide? I skipped that last one because that's actually Big Iron, the, the Sterling engine, so named after Tom Sterling. Um, that, that doesn't, everything else I have is embedded. So. 
If you can build a supercomputer powered up the heat exhausted from another supercomputer, I'd be impressed. That's true. <laughs> call it the, uh, what, what do they call it, the Bernoulli effect or something? But that'd be a Sterling engine. <laughs> yeah. So this wasn't, this wasn't ours. This was um, Carnegie Mellon, I guess, did the fawn. But we did the swan. Because once you've done a fawn, you have to do a super wimpy array of nodes. <laughs> so, and these, what was really cool about this was some guys with some downtime at Debian put Debian Etch on the uh, Netgear uh, WGT634U. And what was really cool about the 634U is that it had uh, uh, socketed uh, radio. So you could swap the radio out and stick your own antenna in there. It also had like, uh, you know, four LAN ports, a WAN port, USB, you could do all sorts of crazy stuff with it. So you yeah, could, you could, one, right? yeah, in fact, they use this. So the RoofNet project used these, these boards. Um, Steve has a lot of familiarity with, with these because everybody uh, in the early days of, of ad hoc mesh networks, they did a lot of prototyping on this, on this board. And it was a, um, and this was also, um, this was a, a, a geode, right? Is that what the processor in these guys were? I, it, this was too early to be armed, so. Uh, anyway, so if you guys, if you guys want to get on both networks, the Things Network and the remnants of the Cambridge Public Internet, I have some of these. And I've got them all flashed with the latest version of Cambridge Public Internet, which is only 10 years old at this point, maybe. But still, you can hit app, get updates. <laughs> uh, I've shown you pictures of those. That, that thing in the uh, corner is, we did another joint project with, um, with Sandia. Sandia loves doing these embedded uh, devices as well. They, they basically, this group at Sandia started Linux BIOS, uh, which is now, um, yes, Corboot. Corboot's still alive and well. Now, it's, they don't support a whole lot of platforms, but, uh, but if you can get Corboot into your, into your BIOS, <coughs> you can get one of those those disk on chips, and if your if your BIOS is socketed, stick it in there. Yeah. So that, that was pretty cool. We had a, so you could run your, your machine off of that and, and diskless netbooting. Um, so then we started getting into ARM Cortex A15. These uh, the Samsung Exynos had not only like four and eight cores per package, but they had slightly better neon Cindy extensions too. So now we're getting into halfway decent flops per dollar or flops per per U, whatever your whatever your figure of merit is. Um, started moving over to the uh, to the first Jetson, which was also ARM Cortex A fifteen, so thirty two bit OS, thirty two bit user space, plus accelerator. Then we moved to uh, when they came out with the first of the ARM Cortex A fifty three and A fifty seven based processors with accelerator on die. 64-bit uh, operating system and 32-bit user space. It took them a little while to get both, yeah. Uh, so, so, so you get this weird, you know how colon RMHF, you know, these, these weird uh, app get updates that you'd see crazy stuff going by. Like, uh, all right, so hopefully they come out with Jetpack 3.0 pretty soon, which they did, that's what we're using now. So, so we're running out of, one of the reasons we have all these goofy names like Ben Nevis and Blorenge is, uh, is these are shorter mountains in Europe than Mont Blanc, and Mont Blanc is, is the big ARM supercomputer. It's something like, I don't know, 30,000 ARM cores or something. It's one of the, in fact, if you go to any of the exascale.eu presentations where they're like, we're gonna build the best machines in the world and it's gonna be entirely European <coughs> technology, Mont Blanc is the poster child for that. Because it's got, it's, the ARM is nominally based out of the UK, even though they've been recently bought by a Chinese company. And, uh, and everything else, the Mont Blanc stuff, it's, it's um, supported by the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So anyway, so there's Blorenge. Um, so I think we may have one other really, Blorenge is like the shortest thing that qualifies as a mountain in Wales. So the ARM guys think this is funny as hell, but, <laughs> but, but judging by the audience, I, I think these, these Scottish and Welsh jokes are kind of hitting the... <laughs> is it made of do you have, um, yeah, I've got a bottle of Ben Nevis at home. Oh, you do? Distillery halfway up the mountain. Okay, yeah, these mountains are way older than like Monadnock. And stuff, <laughs> so. Anyway, so we're gonna, so our next goal for our current crop of, of Jetsons is to, uh, uh, to see how, how much performance per watt per 
some other denominator. I'm thinking square inch, cubic inch, something like that. So, so I, was, I volunteered that we should call it the Kurtz list because that means the short list in German, but nobody's buying that, so I ran it to call it something else. And I did, I did propose that at, at Germany, so anyway. But it turns out the guy, the guy we work with at UMass Dartmouth, um, Professor Kana, he's also in a solar-powered supercomputing. And he's already built a cluster out of Jetson T TX2s. Now, he's not doing it quite the same way we're doing it. I think we can meet. Um, he's got some interesting bits in his software that, uh, that'll give us a, some acceleration. Um, ARM has an entire suite that somewhat parallels what you get from Intel when you buy a complete enterprise solution from them. They've got their own compiler. We don't use it, and they don't even really recommend it all that much. They're, they're like, stick with GCC, but we do have like a GCC 8 if you want it. It's like, really? I mean, would you start your own numbering convention or something? And it's like, no, no, they just, they just iterate a lot quicker than ARM. They've got uh, a custom BLAS library for our, our platform, not just ARM Cortex A57, but for, for Jetson, for Denver. Uh, BLAS, FFT, so anything you want to do that's vaguely like, so, so if you want to run the entire high performance computing suite, which is seven codes, one of them is an FFT, one of them is screen, they, they exercise different parts of the stack. Um, you can get a, a custom library for, for your architecture. And if you go ARM, that's a lot of architectures. I mean, A50, ARM Cortex A57 is just the, it's just the best of the supercomputing targeted processor designs. You can get ARM Cortex A53s. MediaTek sells something that's got uh, ARM Cortex A72s, a couple of APs, and you know, it's like 39 bucks. But you're not gonna use it for supercomputing. You're gonna use it for some really exotic Android phone. In fact, I'm still not sure what the R Cortex A72 is for, but, uh, but it's cheap. R Cortex A57, I haven't found cheap yet. Yeah, Jetson is the cheapest of, of that targeted uh, architecture. Um, all right, so I've used my half hour, but, I, but I, um, I'll leave you with this one photo because this is like from my first slide deck at BLU. So Simpson Garfinkel once wrote an article about what happens when you set a next machine on fire? And, <laughs> and this is, and it was for like, I don't know, for the PC world, there's some, some magazine that doesn't exist anymore. And so this is a photo from that. So, so we had all, like, he must have gotten his next machines from the same pile in the basement of, of the LCS that I got mine. Because that, <laughs> that is definitely a next machine. <laughs> and, uh, and he took a bunch of measurements to see what kind of noxious gases were coming off. But I, so I will post, uh, I'll, I'll send the, uh, the reprint of that article. It's, it's abandoned where, so it's, it's come out of copyright. I'll send, I found it, uh, and uh, I'll send it to Jabber. Um, that, that he actually probably burned a bunch of the machines that I would have just, I would have just used them for Beowulf clustering. But, but I'll also bring over, because I'm, I'm down to my last one, I'm down to my last next machine. I'll bring that over and we can, and we can uh, screw around with the next machine at some point. I mean, when you think about how visionary some of these, I mean, when you think about how visionary the Panda board was for the applications that we were running, uh, everybody said, okay, now is the time that I'm gonna put some time and effort into this. Clint Whaley down in Texas said, I'm in charge of the Atlas Blaz generator. I'm gonna now spend time on ARM. This was the, Panda board was a watershed event for ARM in HPC. I think I still have a couple of next cubes in my attic. Do we really? Although I haven't powered them up in about 20 years. Oh, so I, I, got, I got some updated software for you. Yeah. We can do a performance test. Does anybody do LinPack benchmarks on these things? So that, is, possible? So that is the, the one that you have to do. There's a couple of other nice to have ones, okay. like NAS and HPCG and stuff like that. But if you, but if you want to submit this and get it certified for inclusion into the top 500 list, or the green 500 list, or, or in my case, the Kurtz list. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be number one on the Kurtz list. I'm sure of that. <laughs> so uh, we may not have anybody behind us, but, uh, but I, so that's so. I'm definitely going to be working on the supercomputing part before uh, we meet at the at the Beowulf barn raising on August 11th. But between then and now, we're going to be working a lot on the, the power generation side too. Yep. Gunner, uh, question: If you really want to 
get computing horsepower per cubic centimeter, does that mean you have to go to water cooling? Um, or you can get uh, chips that, that don't dissipate a lot of, so, so the, what NVIDIA has done, has they've gone to some uh, legacy process. Uh, so their node size is like, I don't know, 22 nanometers or something like that. When you buy the latest NVIDIA chip, it's like this. And it's because instead of going to a seven nanometer process, they've just said, the hell with it. We'll just, we'll just ship a big uh, chip. So they, they still use heat sinks, but they don't need active water cooling, which is, which is where everybody else that went to seven nanometers. Interesting. Yeah. So now okay. that having been said, we did find a bunch of ducting and fans on these on these panda board clusters that, that uh, Mozilla gave us, right? So, so maybe they were worried about the temperature that these these OMAP boards go off. Yeah, but I'm going to show you. So this is uh, this is the panda board. I'm going to give probably this one to to Bill, but I may have one for William as well. I I, I put together a collection of parts. I'm going to start building these over the summer, so that we will have at least uh, sandbox in Cambridge to work with. You'll be able to log into these, uh, maybe not to the ones that I'm, I'm giving to people for their residence, but we're given those just for the location. But the ones that we'll have on campus, I talked to SUFA, they've got these, these, uh, you know, these cell phone chargers that have PV and five volt USB out. I mean, there's, there's USB right there. So that's how you power these guys, is you go and you buy a, well, this is the way I've done it because because I wanted to stick a keyboard and a mouse on it. But you don't have to. You can you can take that little Samsung battery uh, cell phone charger that you got, plug USB into it, and this will just work. So I know a bunch of places I can get five volt one amp from for, for free. Big Belly they said they'd partner with the trial. That's a local company. Seahorse Power is in, in Needham, and we've talked to them a couple of times about just sticking one of these into their into their boxes. Now, we're not doing anything for them. They're going to do it to us, for us for, as a favor. I haven't quite figured out what the quid pro quo would be there. But SUFA might, SUFA might find something to run on these. Um, so if we go to ttn.mit.edu, everything you need to know about either building one of these on your own or just building the hard half or the easy half. I'll, I'll give you the hard half. If you guys want one of these, just ask me and I'll give you it. I only have like 10 radios though. So the first 10 radios we're going to put around Cambridge in key locations. Um, however, I'm going to buy more radios too. So if you guys have a, a location, um, I think Bill might be my northernmost uh, node, unless we get one up in Malden, Medford. But uh, but yeah. So so we're going to be able to at least cover because Cambridge is so dense with supas and big bellies. We'll at least be able to cover Cambridge and probably Boston with maybe a dozen or or uh, 18. Because I, because if I do one more order, then I've got, I've got, uh, I got 20 radios. And these are Laura Wen. I, I don't know if you, <coughs> did I miss to explain that these were Laura Wen? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the, um, so I, so my last presentation, I went into a lot of detail on what this does differently than than the internet does. Uh, when I, when we hand these out and it has a nice GUI on it, this will do everything that your garden variety lamp server will do. It'll, it'll have Ethernet, it'll have wireless. There's like eight ways to get into this thing. I'm publishing the root password. Um, you know, uh, you can get in via serial, you can take the SD card out, you can you know, mount the file system. What differs between this and your garden variety lamp server that runs off of the solar panel is, is that we're sticking a 900 megahertz radio on here so that it can talk to the Internet of Things. So this won't talk to anything else but other LoRaWAN uh, attached radios. So if you get one of these, these devices, um, I'll show you after, after the last presentation. There's at least one Kickstarter of a guy selling a device that will talk on this side to the Internet of Things via LoRaWAN, and on this side it'll talk to your phone via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or something like that. So if you're really stuck in some place that doesn't have cellular or Wi-Fi, you can still send messages across LoRaWAN. Because the range on these LoRaWAN radios, on the spec sheet, we don't know this yet, this is why we're running a trial in Cambridge, 
is five kilometers. So that little radio to, to get to get lousy bandwidth and lousy latency, but five kilometers, a lot of people will take that deal, especially if they're getting it free from me. So, uh, <laughs> um, wasn't the limit at Black Hat for into 2011? Didn't they do it in 2011 at like like 120 kilometers? Yeah, exactly. And and that was well. So what they did there that, that's was with hand licensed radios and yeah. directional yes. antennas yes. with people yes. that really know what they're doing yes. in a radio free environment. Yeah. What so power? Mm -hmm. what power? I don't remember the power, but it's not something you're going to do. Not milliwatts. It, it's not part 15 <laughs> power, <laughs> and they were not in a radio rich environment. They were out on a sand flat where you do uh, land speed records. Yeah. And these and these things say FCC class B on them, so I'm thinking whatever the legal Part 15 limit is, which yeah. is is it a watt? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> okay. Didn't they do at least like 45 right, so, using so you're normal up power on eight? Oh, if, 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 if you're out where there's nobody, you know, if you're in the national radio quiet zone, <laughs> breaking the law, you can get wonderful distance. <laughs> Is anybody under 18 years of age? Okay, great. Put the booze away, Jerry. No. Um, okay, so we got a couple things going on here. Um, so, so uh, Joe Cor is in the back, and he's going to tell a little bit about. Uh, I didn't tell him he was going to tell a little bit about, but hopefully he'll talk a little bit about a project at some point in their life. Okay, so the majority, I would say. So what Joe has done is he's taken it uh, to a level of customization of. Uh, of actually building kind of a board and uh, you know getting the design done and sending it out to people and actually making something that uh, that connects to the the Raspberry Pi and Joe maybe you could just talk a little bit about what you've done. Okay, so uh, most people they saw about twelve million Raspberry Pis, right? But probably less than a million of them are being used uh, because. Uh, if you go to on the website and look at the project, right, people will use uh, these dead balls to build circuits. And anybody who has ever, ever built anything before, you know that you are going to make a mistake. Uh, so which means that for most people who try to build something from uh, those things, it's not going to work. <laughs> and <laughs> one thing is that they don't give this uh, schematic diagram. Uh, most of the uh, projects, they show you uh, a picture. Uh, so if you don't have the proper uh, wire colors, uh, your wire is going to be different from uh, what you are seeing in the uh, image, right? So there are a lot of people who are trying to build all these projects uh, that are not going to work. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm building um, uh, a shield where uh, you, uh, you group the pins like uh, two, four, six, uh, so that you have a plug, and then you can just plug in and do your wiring. Uh, so it means that it reduces the chance of taking an error. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so in that way, uh, you can you can use your board very easily uh, because now if you build a circuit, there's no way you can reduce it other than you strip off all and start all over again. And most people don't want to do that. So basically, you build one project, <laughs> and that is it. Uh, so you want to make uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, reusable. Um, uh, so uh, I have a shield. Actually, the board is going to come about next week. But I had a, a small one. Uh, so some of the uh, projects you can do are LED light screen. Uh, you can connect uh, signal. Uh, so basically, you just uh, have this straight in black and uh, wire your, uh, your device. So it's very easy to do. The world's most minimal threat. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but I don't the wiring of the body. Right. That's all you need? Yeah. May, Joe, maybe you could tell them about what it took to actually make the board that you made in terms of the skills and the timing and who actually fabricated it. Well, okay, now you can make it. You can, uh, nowadays it's very, very easy to make a PC board. So, uh, 
there are two Chinese companies, Skit Studio and Free PCB. So uh, for uh, five dollars, you can get ten four by four inch square uh, board uh, with the through hole and double sided, and it costs twenty one dollars to ship from China. So these are both sides. Yeah, double sided. Double sided. Uh, for ten, ten for five dollars. Uh, for uh, three PCB is five dollars and uh, uh, studio, uh, Skit Studio is four <laughs> nine, <laughs> four ninety. <laughs> uh, so uh, Skit Studio is better because uh, three PCB they are paying tricks uh, because they know that a lot of people have small boards, right? So they are counting on the fact that most people are not going to cover a four by four, right? So most people are just going to make a small board, like one inch, right? Uh -huh. uh, so they can make money out of it, right? But for Skid Studio, basically if you buy a four by four space, right? A maximum of four by four, right? And you can put as many designs in that space. So they have kind of part for multiple things. Yeah, so for, uh, for most of my designs, I put about four designs on uh, four by four. So I tried to do that with three PCB and they were charging me $46. <laughs> and so basically they announced that four by four, but if you put several designs on the board, right, then they charge you for each design. Uh, but a uh, speed studio is like, you have four by four uh, space, and can do anything as well you want in that space. How do you spell that? Uh, S-E-E-E-D -E -E studio. Might be three E's. Yeah. S and three E's. No, uh, that's it. Okay, let me see whether I have it correct. Uh, so, but uh, three PCB is faster. You can get your board uh, within a week. Uh, no, I think. Okay, let me see. Let me stop the wait. Let me go. Uh, Holy cow! The, the, the translation is. is good. I mean, I used. Um, I've been using three PCB and the recent report they start with the tricks. Uh, but before then I used to do uh let me see. Seed Studio. Yeah, Seed Studio it has like it's three E's, E's in it. Seed Studio. Is this the studio? Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> it's a very long seed. Yeah. Uh so so they are, uh, if you are trying to do something, they are a bit alternative in the sense that uh, you have a, a maximum of four by four uh, space, right? And you can put as many designs in that space as you like. So no tricks. Three <laughs> uh, PCB, uh, if, if they think you have more than one design, they want to charge you for it. <laughs> So if anybody has any questions so on fake leaves that go between your different projects, so <laughs> no, I mean, it doesn't matter. Okay, I, 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 <laughs> no, I used to do that. So I did, uh, I did it with uh, this board, and then this size uh, they decided to charge me, and I said, uh, so I decided to check uh, to check seats to you because I used to use them before, and then and I realized that oh, they are cheaper than this so. Now that they are my new friend. <laughs> so if anybody uh, has any questions on how to custom build their own board, then they should talk to Joe afterwards. And uh, he certainly could help you out and point you in the right direction. And, uh, and he, he certainly knows his stuff. <laughs> okay, so uh, so now this is my board. Okay, it's it's uh, it's a one off. It definitely is. Thank you, Joe, for that. Yeah. Uh, it's a one off. It costs significantly more to make than Joe's board. Um, it would have been nasty to ship from China, but there there's really a, a, a reason for this. So I'll go through some slides. Uh, I have some slides from an April meeting that would potentially be of interest to folks who weren't here. Then, in general, what it talked about was uh, programming on the Raspberry Pi 0W, which is this little board. It's about this big. There are actually three of them on this board here. Ten bucks. Does anybody have one? Raspberry Pi 0. Yeah. Joe's stuff works with it. 
Oh, really? Is that only two? Uh, who's got a Raspberry Pi Zero W? So you got, where'd you buy it? So how much does it cost? Ten bucks. Okay. So everybody should run right out and buy uh, one. They only sell you one at ten bucks. Uh, the second one is like fourteen or something like that. It's it's a little bit more money. Oh, uh, uh, orange Pi is compatible with the Raspberry Pi and it's cheaper. Right. So, so the, in the slides that I had from April, I kind of walked through uh, the, the essentially the ecosystem or the market for these kinds of small boards. The thing that's beautiful about the Raspberry Pi is, and you know, and Stephen in particular probably knows I was a bit of a skeptic two, three, four years ago when it first came out. Uh, it took a while for it to get, you know, when they were custom building uh, versions of Python for it, it's, it's like, do you really want to jump on that bandwagon? But clearly now it's, it's a standard. And the fact, and there are distributions, and there's a lot of support for it, which there may not be for some of the other boards that, uh, there's just a massive proliferation of low cost, high power, computationally capable boards from particularly China, right? And Orange Pi is one of them, and there are a bunch of others that we'll talk about. Um, picked up a Samsung small TV recently, uh, just over $100. It's a smart TV, it's got Wi Fi, it does all sorts of things. I was in the store, and it was just what I wanted uh, a smaller thing that I could use for these smaller devices. And it's in, it's one of these big box stores. And there are, of course, the, you know, 50 inch and the 60 inch and the seven, who knows, the, the whole, and there's a little kid, he couldn't have been more than 10, or he sees me looking at this monitor and he says, man, is it, that must be like a baby's screen, you know? <laughs> and, and you can just think this kid's probably got like a 70 inch TV on his, you know, and it's, you go where you want with that. But, um, but anyways, the fact that you can get for just over $100, uh, very high quality, uh, you know, television that's a smart, it's basically, it's a smart computer, all in one, right? right. Over 100 bucks, exactly, right? So, you know, how long, I mean, Samsung, it, again, is a company that's, you know, people are making their own chips now, of course, right? Their own design, everything. Okay, so the purpose here was, coincidentally, around the time Kurt and, and John and Jerry and others started talking about uh, the, the agenda for this meeting, I was working on some stuff to, to take advantage of, because the problem we had two, three years ago was that all the chips, and I was personally looking at some of the Atom things, and, and the beauty of that, I was looking for things that could run a standard operating system. Because I think there's huge leverage if, if you can start to build applications around and establish, and you don't have to worry about the underlying veneer of an operating system, right? So now you've got a $10 Raspberry Pi Zero W, so it's got Wi-Fi in it. So, uh, you know, is it 900 megahertz? Is it this, you know, thread protocol you're gonna use? Is it, I believe that, you know, Wi-Fi is ubiquitous. It is in your thermostats. It is in your TVs. It is in your refrigerator. It's everywhere, right? So, it, is it a little bit higher, you know, drain on the power? Absolutely. Are there gonna be uh, more economic, cheaper technologies? Absolutely. Have they worked out the bugs? Have they had alliances that have sort of figured out the interoperability of uh, stuff. For, for sure, actually, over a long, 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 long period of time. What, those of us who had Wi-Fi when it first came out, you know, right? You had to pick the right, you know, uh, 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 the G wasn't the G wasn't the G. It depends upon if you got it from this vendor or that vendor or another vendor, right? If B wasn't B wasn't, they didn't interoperate. Now they all do. And, and you know, and so finally, probably a lot of people in this room kind of got on the bandwagon when N came along, right? And the, you know, but but there was only one vendor. Who was the first one to come out with the N? Um, it was, was it Linksys or there was only one vendor who had the N, you know, Wi-Fi stuff, and it was like magic. But you had to get all the hardware from them. Now it's ubiquitous, right? Okay. Um, come on, the, the IEEE is newbies. I mean, you you got to go back to the old stuff, the way the, the Waveland. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, and then of course it's it's for a while there, uh, people in China were trying to come up with their own kind of versions of Wi-Fi and stuff like that. I don't know why this is a, a German meme tonight, but yeah. it's, you know, dare not perform. And there's, okay, so this is more geared towards the younger audience. I added this in as I was struggling to find my way back to this room, uh, which is a bit of a challenge, because like they blocked off the roads <laughs> and they, they, you know. And so I finally, you know, I followed the detours to nowhere. And, and of course, you know, if I did get here, I couldn't park anyways, I guess. But, <clears throat> so I ended up on Mem Drive. Don't quite know how, even though I'm a great navigator. 
And uh, I managed to back in a fairly you know, large vehicle uh, in, you know, via parallel parking. And as I'm unloading, <coughs> by the way, the, the theme is kind of the Home Depot theme, the orange <coughs> stuff, you know. Um, it's kind of like just, you know, just do it with a, anyways, and a, and a guy tried to pull into, he tried to back into this space. Now, he had a Honda, a small Honda, okay? And, uh, and, and he failed. And I'm watching him as I'm unloading my thousand pounds of trying to figure out how I'm going to get it here. And so the point, particularly to the younger folks, is don't give up. You know, if you see an opportunity and an open space on Mem Drive at seven o'clock at night on a weekday is an opportunity. To, anyway, so he gave up and he just, you know, he, he moved on. So particularly to the younger people in the audience, when you see an opportunity like that, uh, d don't don't miss it. Okay. On to the parking is not an obsolete skill. <laughs> no. Okay, so this is my quick agenda. Solar stuff, ACDC, uh, not the musical group, but uh, talking about Pi, uh, talking about my view of, the, of, of supercomputing in the future, maybe the distant future, uh, is, is all about software, and then we'll have some extra credit stuff, okay? Um, so Stephen Ronan, the other spelling of Ronan, uh, <laughs> sent this, any, uh, uh, so there's this new kind of, how, how do you pronounce it, Stephen, do you know? Perovskite? What's that? Perovskite? Yeah, how, maybe you could describe it for the benefit of people. Yeah. Uh, it's a crystalline form uh, doped with lead, and it arranges itself, it's a self-assembling nanostructure, and to make to make PVs as cheap as dirt, you want to make it out of dirt. Well, perovskite PVs are as close to dirt in terms of materials that we've come up with yet. Not only that, but the film, the thin film, is just as thin as cadmium telluride or SIGs. So you're using a cheap material and you're using very little of it. And in the lab, it only took, took five years for them to get to 20%. That's sort of a one-minute capsule. So, so oh, somebody said this guy Ignacio Perez Arriaga, who writes for the MIT Energy Initiative, said, "Goodbye, silicon. Hello, perovskite." <laughs> so, could you give the one-minute synopsis for people in the room who are not familiar with this solar panel stuff and how you take the okay. rays of the sun? How they what? How how, how you take the rays of the sun? and convert it into something that I can store in this battery here uh, for useful purposes. The simple form is Einstein was right. Photons can knock electrons off atoms. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. what he actually won his Nobel Prize for. Not all that relativity stuff. <laughs> really? Yeah. The, yeah. You start with, if you know what a diode is, a diode establishes a, uh, a voltage barrier and and that voltage barrier is what you see when you run voltage in the forward direction through a diode. That same type of barrier exists in a photovoltaic cell and still in fact you can make a photovoltaic cell work like a diode if you keep the light off. It. The, the optical energy that comes in is about one and a half to two electron volts. You actually only get about a half an electron volt out of it. Uh, but that, ba that, that voltage barrier is enough so that the el electricity that jumps that barrier has to go, the only way it can get back is around the external circuit. And the external circuit is where you put your load. I took more than a minute. I'm but I think I that's pretty, the people get in general, that's a pretty, that's a good, both those are good descriptions to give, uh, you know, in a nutshell, that, that's great. So uh, we'll, I'll show a picture of it. So the point here again is that uh, there actually are improvements potentially in the offing and that, you, you know, if it could be as cheap as dirt, the same way that silicon is cheap as sand, uh, you know, that's promising from the standpoint of innovation and progress. Okay. Now, the, the, uh, the, the deer knocked before. So people know there's a solar eclipse coming up in August. It's a pretty big deal. Uh, Bill, I somewhat prepped you with that you want to give your 
uh, this is a summary for the group, if you wouldn't, could you? Um, what it is and why it's eclipses, significant. Yeah, solar eclipses are wonderful. Do not look at it directly, uh, get, unless you have proper protection. Um, and it's not going to happen here. You've got to drive someplace else or fly someplace else. Um, for many of you, this is not the last opportunity within your lifetime. For some of us, it might be, so I'm going to go see it. <laughs> but, you know, it's, this is a case where it, it's coincidental that the moon is half a degree wide and the sun is half a degree wide, and they're both in the ecliptic. So every once in a while, they're in front of each other. So, so it's it's a big deal. So that's great, and it's coming soon Science. to to uh, you know a month from now. Where are you going to go, Bill? It's Kentucky, South right? South Carolina. Yeah. South Carolina is that one of the mm. best viewing spots? No, the best viewing spot is the desert in eastern uh, Oregon and Idaho because there'll be less clouds. Oh, I only got a seventy percent chance if I stay in one spot in South Carolina of being cloud free. They say. But I've actually seen occasions where the shadow racing across disrupts the clouds and punches a hole for me. So I'm hoping my luck holds, and I'm going to be at the center of a stretch of interstate that follows the path of the eclipse. <laughs> You're going to do so anti-cloud chasing. So I can do anti-cloud chasing. So I was going to ask how cloud chasing. So I think I can handle anti cloud chasing. I was going to ask how long does it last, but I was assuming you were, you know, stationary. <laughs> I am what? not going to be stationary. Yeah. So how long does it last if you were were to be stationary on the it's, surface of the Earth? Uh, from first nibble to last uh, nibble, it may be half an hour. If so you're in, if you're in the exact center line, if you're one side or the other in the path, it'll be quicker. So you don't want to miss the bus. You want to be there in time. And, and, and the, the reason this is a tie-in is because if you're reliant on solar energy for that period of time, uh, you just better have your battery. And actually, it's a pretty significant, I mean, it's like you know 9,000 megawatts of power is for the duration of that period of time. Is it's not a lot of megawatt hours. Right. For, the, for the benefit of people who haven't, I mean, I guess everybody's seen solar panels, but this actually serves two purposes. These are just a couple solar panels, and on, it's real simple in some sense. So on the back, they have a positive and a negative, you know, connection, and those are the things that you feed into uh, what's known as a charge controller. Okay. So this is where it gets both interesting and and uh, you know a little bit trickier. So. On this board here, there are these two boxes, right? They don't cost a lot of money nowadays, 20, 30, 40 bucks. Uh, that, you know, these, I think, probably both came from China. And they're charge controllers. And they've got little microcontrollers inside of them that are smart about essentially trickle charging the levels of energy from the solar panel in, in a manner that the battery can maximally uh, take advantage of. Okay, that's the extent of what I know, uh, which isn't much, but um, but basically each of the solar controllers they have three connections more or less: one from the solar panel, one that's the, the input of the charge. The little microcontroller in this device is sensing how much is coming in, how much is, and then one going out to the battery to charge it, and then typically there's another terminal set that would go out to some kind of output device, some kind of load, whether it's a light or a pump or something like that, okay? So in a nutshell, uh, you know, you can get these solar panels pretty cheap. They're fun to experiment with. Uh, one of the interesting uh, things, and I'll get into standards a little bit, these just have straight cables that you can kind of plug into a battery or a charge controller or something like that. But they also have these interconnects uh, that are used to lock together the cables so that, of course, you don't want them falling apart. So this is where you get into standards, right? It's a whole different world of standards from what the digital world of standards is all about. Anybody a licensed plumber or electrician or ever have anybody in a, you know, some of the most interesting stuff that, that somebody earlier on talked about, Kurt, uh, the, the building codes and the 48 volt wire and stuff like that. By the way, don't do any of this at home in part. This is my, you know, you plug this in and this is, this is AC stuff. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, this is a DC converter, right? And so, and these are GFI outlets, so if you're standing in a pool of, of uh, water, you, you know, you, you probably shouldn't do that anyways. Uh, <laughs> this is a, a circuit tester. This is kind of the 30 seconds of, you know, AC wiring knowledge that I have. Uh, to tell you if you've got a good closed circuit, a grounded circuit, or not, 
And, and uh, you know, your building codes may or may not allow you to do different things uh, with it. But, but the point is that uh, there are lots of standards, even to the point, if you go through Home Depot sometime or Lowe's or your local home department store and count how many different types of electrical boxes. You know, the blue ones are kind of so-called new work and then there's the old work and then there's the metal boxes and then there's, there's, there's just a wide array of standard types of interconnect devices or uh, connection devices. It's a whole new world if you spend like a lot of time in, in software, right? Okay, so, but the idea of this board is that, you know, the AC stuff is so that you can use it even when you don't have, you know, DC solar uh, stuff to work with. So the AC is kind of set up to convert things over to DC, and then you can do your experimentation on the, the Raspberry Pi or whatever else you got. And each of these, uh, so Kurt showed a bunch of stuff with, you know, kind of racks of computers, right? So this is the tray computer concept. So, you know, for, these, for two bucks, you get these little blue uh, trays at Home Depot and the electrical department. And they're actually really good for sticking sensors in. And then, why, so each of the trays, the, these little uh, boxes, uh, they've got a Raspberry Pi Zero in it. And, and then some mix of uh, sensors or devices or, you know, they've got cameras and they've got passive infrared motion sensors and they've got switches. And this thing is just chock full of switches which, um, uh, and so essentially the, the, the AC converts to DC, and then this is kind of the DC side of things. And then the other thing is beautiful about DC, and, and the reason you want to get to DC is so that you can get to the five volts to power the, the Raspberry Pis, okay? So, so that's the advantage, and plus it's, it's a little hard to get electrocuted when you're messing around with DC <laughs> stuff than with AC stuff. So there are lots of advantages, particularly for the younger. Well, and it, 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 it. Is it God speak? If, yeah. if you've got amperage, right. DC is more effective at electrocuting you than AC. Right. So of the skin effect on AC. Yeah. Um, and a, a so, so a 12 volt starter battery is capable of welding. So, so would your advice so, to the younger people in the audience be don't start with uh, a car battery, for instance? Yeah. And you. Learn some basic electrical safety. Yeah, I, I, I've already said don't do any of this at home. But yeah, yeah but it'll probably void your um, your homeowner's your, insurance, your, your, as, well, as your renter's insurance, and your right. lease. Right. Um, when you have a freestanding building that you paid off the uh, mortgage on, you know, knock yourself out. Um, Kurt gave the example once. Kurt, I don't know if you remember this. I I, uh, I do not understand why you're going to up conversion to AC and then down conversion back to five volts. Why not use a DC to DC modern um, switching cap thingy to make five volt instead of using the switching thingy to make AC and then use another switching thing to convert the AC back to DC. So, so, uh, so a couple things ago, conversions. Let's talk conversions briefly. Okay, it's a lot more efficient than it used to be. So, so every time you plug in your cell phone to, to charge it at, at night, let's say people, most people do that probably daily. You're converting typically from AC to DC, and then your phone is being charged with DC, right? And and not only DC but five volt DC. So you know your car battery is typically 12 volts. The world is really standardized around this five volt stuff and the USB stuff, and so look to do more and more. Five volt stuff would be, you know, my thinking. But but, but your phone, don't take a bath and let your phone fall in. Uh, <laughs> Earl just got electrocuted in the last week. Yeah. Her phone fell in the tub. She was charging it. Yeah, yeah. 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 it was real. It was real. The outlets outside there. And I was like, Shocking yeah. experience. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of you know bad stuff that can happen. But uh, Kurt gave the example which I wanted to just get off. Uh, about somebody dropped a, a wrench on like the car battery and they hit both terminals at the same oh, time and yeah. just kind of you know melted right before their eyes. So I've so seen, I've seen batteries explode. Yeah. So there's no you know not to make light of any of this that uh, that you know th there really is stuff that that can harm you. Uh, but but the point is that one of the applications of of these solar panels this this actually the path of the. Uh, Okay, so we talked a little bit about ACDC. 
but the point of that really was, when it comes to connecting DC connections, just in terms of homebrew or do-it-yourself, it, it, there really aren't standards that I've found on how to do simple interconnects of, of your DC circuitry. So like what Joe did, he kind of custom built his own board. Uh, even the Raspberry Pi Zero, it doesn't come with headers on the, you know, so you either got to solder on your own or you got to, uh, you know, kind of, so actually it, it, it's an impediment, I think, to, to easy prototyping. So I think a simple board for somebody to make would be a simple little header board to, uh, to marry to the Raspberry Pis and for a few bucks you'd, you'd be in business. But uh, so actually what I ended up doing as an interconnect scheme for some of this DC stuff, you'll see that uh, it's actually just a standard AC plug, right? <laughs> and, and so the question becomes, well, how do you, because in DC, it, although typically, <coughs> in, in DC it matters which is the, the positive and which right. is the negative, right? Um, so the question is, how do you kind of make sure that you've got the interconnect right? <coughs> so I just use uh, polarized plugs where, you know, one is a little bit bigger than the other. And so you always make sure that uh, th that the plugs that you're <coughs> plugging, now, the, the thing I didn't do, and you should be cautious of, is, is uh, you know, you don't want to plug the DC one into the AC outlet. Yeah, yeah. I'm reacting right now. And, and, yeah. and, and, and no. it, is, it is a best practice to use different shaped plugs for different kinds of power. So does anybody know the, of, of plugs that are available for DC? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, um, could you send, could you send a link? Anderson Power Pole. Could you send a link to me so I know? Just come to the MIT flea market. I'll, I'll paint it purple <laughs> next time. I, I hadn't really thought of that until, and I personally have not done it. And again, don't do any of this stuff at home. Do you know those? Only you, under Ed's supervision. Do you know those right? little sleeve connectors that you see? Yeah. Like the 12 volt ones? Yeah. If you go to, uh, you do it electronics, they have them all. And they actually designed them so that they were available at different voltages so that if you didn't know what you were doing, you couldn't put 12 volts into a five volt hole. They're designed for that. <coughs> and so if you want to be strictly on board, you can get a five volt sleeve uh, barrel and pin connector. And is it sensing the voltage or is it just? No, it's just a piece of couple It's just of based on the width. It's just of a plug. Of it the doesn't plug. have any right. intelligence right. in it. It's just a wire, you attach your wires to the connector, you got a male and a female, and you put them and together. Right. So, the so Japan, it's called the J E I C or something plug. Yeah. Japan Electronic Commission. So a whole nother, a, a whole nother, uh, you know, kind of sub education in when you start getting into, particularly this, particularly with solar, because you know, like they, they, they're uh, some of them are 12 volts, some of them are 24 volts, some of them are God knows what volt, right? Um, so, so all of a sudden you start to be concerned about, you know, if you start stringing together multiple panels, now you're talking different amperage. Now you're talking, you know, you don't want to be putting lots of amperage through, you know, tiny little wires, right? So you've got to kind of get educated on what gauge is this and what gauge is that. And again, you can learn <coughs> a fair amount from your local friendly um, electrician. Okay, so for the benefit of, of the people who weren't here last time, we went through this whole experience of uh, how we connect, and we took some pictures with the Raspberry Pi Zero right from here out to there, and these are the images that came up. Uh, this is the board. I didn't want to bring water into the classroom because goodness knows I, I get enough problems as it is, but, uh, but I'll just show you. This is kind of the board functioning, and I'll explain. You know, just it's all connected up, and you know, it's, it's tied into this pump, and the pump, all it's doing is it's circulating uh, the pump is in one of these bins here. Oh, it's right here. Uh, so all that was doing is it's a you know it's a 12 volt uh, boat build pump basically, right? So the other thing is once you start to get into DC, all of a sudden now you're you're dealing with products from like boats or RVs or cars, and there's just a wealth of products, uh, you know, hardware, engineered uh, devices. They can do neat things that can lock your doors or unlock your doors that, you know, make your windshield wipers go back and forth. And that's a whole world of uh, devices that, you know, horns that sound and lights that, these are actually lights that are trailer lights from, uh, again, 12 volt types of things. And uh, they actually, these buttons here, these switches rather, are, you know, they're all car switches from, uh, you know, console control. 
types of things. So the, the application for this was, um, you know, a couple. One was if you if you uh, are living in a place where water buildup is a concern, and if it's uh, you know it's a seasonal thing, you're not always around. If you want to know water is there, you know, kind of like a smart pump sort of thing. Another application was somebody wanted to basically pump water. Uh, you know, up over uh, into a different destination, and the question was how. And it turns out that, uh, you know, so the suggestion was, well, create kind of a solar-powered pump. Y and you can get real sophisticated about it. You can throw a Raspberry Pi in, and all of a sudden, you know, build a website, and, and you can read it or access it from wherever you are. Um, or you could just do something that's purely mechanical, and that's, that's you know, switch on, switch off kind of thing. Actually, in here is um, so here is the the video. I won't I won't go to it, but it was completely you know separate. It was just an idea of how you could use a solar device and some kind of a smart control mechanism and a simple pump. And it turns out there's this guy in Ireland who actually has made a business out of doing. Uh, exactly that. Okay, now this is a device which I haven't actually tested out, but it should work. It's not, uh, I guess it's here. One of the problems I've always had coming to these meetings is the, the, the um, you know, kind of how do you hitch into the MIT network, uh, but uh, still have an Ethernet connection, because some devices, you know, they still want to, so this is a simple repeater, Wi-Fi repeater, and, you know, it's like 25 bucks, and what it does is it picks up a Wi-Fi signal, and then uh, essentially just repeats it. So if you're beyond the safe distance of what the Wi-Fi should do. Additionally, it has an Ethernet connection in it, which is kind of useful for you know, a, a home or office use or you know, someplace out back. But again, I think the, from my perspective, uh, this Internet of Things, as it spreads and as devices, you know, they go beyond the reach of the home modem kind of thing. The question is how, do you, how many people have repeaters in their residence or uh, anybody? Hook them in. Just, just. I, I have one. Yeah. It might not be that exact one. But yeah. So th there's a bunch to choose from. It's a range extender, I guess, is what they call it. I don't know if that's different than a repeater. Okay. Relays. The, uh, people ever use relays? Uh, we use relays all the time, and you know, probably cars and stuff like that. Uh, simple, simple device that is really pretty useful. And again, this is one of those things. That, you know, don't do this at home, but. Uh, you can watch people on the internet, you know, burn things up and stuff. But basically what you do is you can connect your low power uh, Raspberry Pi control, uh, you know, connects down here. And then the top bar of terminals are things that you can, um, you can control with, with the, based on the Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi, it only, uh, you know, puts out really teeny tiny amounts of power, of real low amperage kind of stuff. And, and it also takes in only teeny tiny amounts of electricity and a really low amperage. And if you overdo it, you, you blow it up, right? So the question is, how do you do something like, for instance, um, activate this 12 volt horn from the Raspberry Pi? So you can use something like a relay. So what you do is you take one of the pins off your Raspberry Pi, you connect it up to the bottom row of pins there, and, uh, and that effectively is one circuit that's talking. And then the top row, you essentially plug in your other circuit, which might be a 12 volt, big amperage, uh, or you know, could be an AC power thing, uh, light, and this is where you start to get into you know, what codes are applicable and how dangerous can, do, do you want to get. Uh, those relays and circuits tend to be uh, gauged for different amounts of amperage. So you know, a, a, a household light is different than a uh, hair dryer, which is different than you know an arc welding machine, right? And so they're the, the, and they would either be uh, open by default or closed by default, and then the Raspberry Pi is the thing that would toggle it. And all relays are it's really simple mechanism. Somebody can correct me if I'm if I misspeak on this, but effectively all you're doing when you toggle it with the Raspberry Pi is you're activating a magnet. And the magnet is either closing or opening the circuit. And so when the magnet kind of kicks, so you take a little bit of power from the Raspberry Pi, you hit that little pin, and it says, you know, uh, let the magnet go. And the magnet either kind of, you know, creates a new circuit or closes it. And then that new circuit is wired and geared up to handle high voltage, high amperage. Okay? So 
These are great little devices. They don't. This particular one, it's got uh, it's got four relays on it, so you could you could have you know either four separately controlled. You can have four separately controlled circuits. Now each one of the circuits could you know have any number of devices on it, up to you know one little beep could kind of open the gate and open the garage door and you know open lots of other stuff as long as it was. Anyway, so these are really useful, fun to experiment with. You definitely, you know, they could be dangerous. You could do bad things, but um, you know, it's it's okay. So the question is, what about? And this is, I haven't got numbers to compare. Kurt may know off the top of his head how the Raspberry Pi power, you know, curve maps to what we were doing with the Shiva plugs some years ago, or what we were trying to do with the atoms, uh, you know, boards and stuff like that. But but the gist of it is. Um, and there was a question from, you know, before the meeting, that Raspberry Pi is not great at, at uh, they, whether they cut out the circuitry for deep sleep stuff, or they just didn't include it, or it's just, you know, um, it's not significant enough. But, but this is what, you know, these are the numbers that some reputable person has, uh, has put together. So it is clearly at a point now, because these are, the history of the Raspberry Pi basically, it was a cell phone chip, right? that they, it was an old cell phone chip that the, the engineers and architects of the Raspberry Pi basically talked, is it Broadcom? It, 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 it was a Broadcom chip, right? Uh, they basically talked them into letting them use for cheap the old chips, uh, and they were super low energy, okay? So, you know, will you ever, uh, another, I guess, I don't think I have it here, but uh, the expressive chip, ESP8226, is that whatever the magic number is? So that does have more um, sort of control over the deep sleep and, and, and the whole bit, uh, but it's much less capable and functional. It does have Wi-Fi on it. It does, uh, you can program it with either an Arduino-like, you know, uh, tool set or the C programming language. Uh, this is my chance maybe to plug uh, this Go language. People heard of Go? People, so uh, it, it's, you know, it's really a versatile, uh, you, you know, beautiful language in my opinion. And the nice thing about it is uh, you can do cross compilation. So you can build things on bigger, more beefy uh, desktop or laptop computers. And then you can just kind of spit out an executable for the Raspberry Pi. So you can essentially do, and, and the thing is not, um, hardware is really hard. I mean, there's, there's the, you know, it's time consuming, it's complicated, uh, it's arduous to, it's error prone, highly error prone, right? Not that software isn't, because it is as well. But the sooner you get above the hardware level layer to, to actually do things in software, the, the sooner you can really, you know, create pretty, pretty magnificent things, right? So, uh, so Go gives you the potential to do that. And one of the things is, it's it's in one of these. I'll skip over that. Uh, so so. You know, the concept of the software, so, so my idea would be, look, you get 50 Raspberry Pis, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's still under a thousand bucks, right, even if you pay the escalation clause from Micro Center, uh, and you tie them all together. So this is something that came from, I think it's the Tumblr folks who open sourced some of the technology that they, uh, you know, basically developed in Go. Uh, and the idea is that it's kind of a thin layer of an operating, it's a Docker-like solution, but the idea is you could have every one of these devices and they may not have the math functions and, and, and stuff that you want to do, but you could have every one of your 50 uh, Raspberry Pis, one might be going out to check the, you know, the weather, one might be going out to test the, 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 the how much water is in the soil, one might be going out to, so it's a different kind of, I mean, there are a lot of different definitions of what a supercomputer is, right? And they've got tests and they've got metrics and, uh, but this is more along the lines of uh, kind of a cloud supercomputer where it can do a lot of different things controlled and, and coordinated by software. So again, this they call it, you know, the go circuit. Um, and the idea would be you can have something that does the front end for the database and something that does the front end for handling images and something that so forth and so on. Okay. Uh, this is the, the thing I've given, and then we, if there are any questions, this demonstration on, uh, it's this HP uh, computer, right? 
it's the it's the stream, and uh, you know people who know me know that uh, for a long time I've been looking for inexpensive functional devices that you can run Linux on, right? Because that's the, that's what the group is all about, and and. Uh, and of course, you know, Ubuntu has a really good distribution, and there are a bunch of different distributions. So this thing, any guesses how much this costs? One ninety-nine. No, I wish. No, it's two nineteen, right? So it's it's um, you know it's a fully it, well it came with Windows ten, and if I you know if I could have tra which is pretty good, you know. So for two nineteen, you get uh, Windows ten. It's it's all new it's, uh, technology. It's pretty functional, and you know you can program with it. You can do. Uh, and Ubuntu installed like beautifully. No hiccups, no glitches, no radio problems, no nothing. So it was, uh, it, you know, it was, it, the, uh, the trackpad works as you would expect. It's got HDMI out. It doesn't have Ethernet. Uh, probably got a few other things in it too. But does for, it have USB know, three? What's that? USB three. And you can check. It's got it's got three USBs, but I don't know that that's USB it's three. The only kicker is it has. Uh, what is it? 32 gigs of storage, and it's soldered on. Which means, meaning you can't. Um, it's, it's not expandable at all. It's got an SSD on. Right? So, so it's so all yeah, flash storage. Flash yeah. storage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so it's got which, which, so one side of it is you can't expand it. We're probably the other side of it is uh, we're probably not going to go over. It's, it's, it's still better. Anyway. Uh, Ten hours, I think, is what they claim. I don't know. I just run it. So it's an SSD. Anyways, two nine. Any any questions or comments? Sure. Yeah. Any questions? Sure. <coughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at storage systems, battery uh, storage systems, um, large scale for solar stuff? Because I. I Somehow YouTube has started to show me videos of what people are making uh, their own Tesla power walls by stripping uh, cells out of broken laptop batteries. They, uh, they, 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 strip, they, they find the batteries that are still working in, in these, uh, these dead battery packs and getting hundreds or thousands of these lithium ion cells and, and have massive amounts of storage. Yeah, so, so um, you know, lithium batteries explode. Uh, <laughs> you know, charging them is uh, is a whole different, you know, we talked about the charge controllers, right? They, and, and if you don't charge them right, they, they explode faster, and I think that was, you know, we've seen some of that in commercial product. So, anyways, what I do is, and I don't, this is, a, you know, I'm not recommending this and don't do any of this at home, but, but marine deep cell batteries, they're designed to, to drain. You can, you know, recharge them in a, a, a bunch of different ways. They're commercially widely available and inexpensive. But they um, don't uh, source uh, as many amps at once as a cranking battery, so it depends on your application. Yeah, it's, it's going to do, so for instance, the, you know, a car battery is designed, and I'm not a battery expert, but it's designed to give you, a, you know, a gazillion amps when it's 20 or low, right? And, and, you know, personally, you know, it's I'm not designed to be run all the way down to damage. Mm -hmm. And, and really further, furthermore, it's designed not to be run down more than, is it 50% or, you know? So, so, so it's got a pretty, you know, narrow window of functional usage. Uh, on the other hand, they now have these cute little things they use DC to DC converters that will upkit from whatever is left in your formerly 12 volt battery to charge up a supercapacitor uh, with enough amp hours to crank the engine. Uh, and it's yeah. uh, so, the, so the good news is that it's also usable as a grenade. In, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're right. <laughs> T Ten years from now, we're not going to need crank engines because they're all going to be electric, right? But uh, anyways, I just use marine deep cell batteries. Do you have a question? Well, it's, it's just that mm. if you're smart about using lithium ion batteries, these inconsistent cells, which is a bit of a whole lot of cells, they're not particularly dangerous. If you charge them with an actual, like a non cell to charge them, they won't have fire explosions. Yeah, well, because they're, they're in lots of electric cars, so, you know. So that's hey, guys. Time, but. So, um, 
I, I've never actually presented here. My name is Ed Romer, and uh, I've come here for a long time. And part of what I've, I've been uh, trying to do is work in uh, the K-12 education space, uh, K-12, trying to sort of evangelize STEM and, and uh, programming, Linux. Uh, recently, an opportunity came up uh, with a trip up here with uh, a trip to uh, with Kurt and some other folks uh, over at uh, MIT's Beaverworks. And, uh, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with the race car project that they've done for a few years. It's a one-tenth scale autonomous vehicle. Um, the, the idea here is is to kind of walk through this quickly. Is, is just to create a, a collaborative project-based environment where kids solve real-world problems. And what we saw, and I'm kind of fired through these slides a little bit, is to, to sort of introduce AI and robotics. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really to give these kids and start it, energizing schools to give kids a leg up on what's happening. Um, the Clipping through these slides is kind of, you know, the idea was to, to step away from the traditional classroom model and, and take something that's worked very well, particularly here at MIT, with uh, direct project-based learning, uh, hands-on, um, and you know, to, to give you an idea here, we, we, we kind of worked with uh, the folks here at MIT with uh, Beaverworks who were very, uh, you know, very grateful for their help. Um, as well as Kurt and uh, those three uh, MIT Europe students helping us here um, who've been staying with me down in the Cape where we have these uh, six students plus a couple others who have started working through the same curriculum. And just to give you an idea, the school when we started offered no, uh, no real Linux uh, experience. Uh, we had to purchase some actual laptops because they had moved to iPads and moved away from things. So they moved toward a, towards kind of a closed system, um, which is kind of counter to what's happening. Um, and uh, we were able to introduce them to li the Linux operating system, uh, virtual machines, uh, text editors, uh, jumped into the Python programming language. Uh, now they're working through, they've had to, we had to grapple with a cohort of uh, uh, 9 through 12th graders, uh, with one 9th grader, one 12th grader. Most of these guys are middle 10th, 11th grade. Uh, we had to do, introduce trigonometry concepts and calculus, where most of them hadn't been exposed to it yet. Um, to do that, we pulled out a friend of mine who's come here a couple times, who's a Course 18, 1970 graduate, and took 40 years of mathematical evangelism, and I think did a pretty good job of introducing uh, the theory um, under a curve and uh, how to find out where you are immediately in intervals. Um, you know, so that's basically uh, what I have. The car uh, represents th these cars that are in various shape over here that we're building. Uh, one that will drive at the end here. Um, that will actually, will, will, it has some code, so we'll push some code to the NVIDIA Jetson that's on there, and uh, it'll drive itself down the hall. And it's got some basic code, so it actually can navigate. And the idea is that in the end, on August 5th and 6th at the Johnson Ice Rink, uh, a team of about 50 kids from up here that are here residentially for a month, as well as ourselves and a group from Mexico, will compete in an autonomous uh, Grand Prix. Um, the track won't be revealed until the 5th. So the cars generally, it's more about the coding, the collaboration, the teamwork uh, to design something. And just to give people an idea, the, the leap from automatic and automated to autonomous is, is huge. And unlike uh, some of our current politicians who say it's so far on the horizon, I've brought AI and machine learning to Orleans, Massachusetts with high school kids. So I, I, I disagree with their statements. Um, and in, in that, we founded uh, something along the lines of uh, Beaverworks uh, called WarriorWorks. We took the school's mascot, we added works to it. And uh, we're hoping that's something that can potentially scale on a national level, and we're, we're taking steps to sort of move in that direction over the next few months. Um, that's what I have. Um, I could, uh, if any of you guys want to say anything a little bit about uh, what we've been doing, or what do you think? Sam, I think, volunteered to put some code up here. Yeah. Uh, maybe give you a quick little demo of the, which thing we need here. So the Grand Prix on the 4th and 5th is going to be modeled after the Boston Grand Prix that got canceled a year ago. Awesome. Yeah. So, all, so all the curves are the same and the street Thank names you know, are the same Walsh. and everything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is that in August? August 4th. Oh, yeah. 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 I can pop some lights on. Yeah, so. yeah. And everybody is confused that it seems great to park on this car. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I kind of went quickly because I know you guys, it's kind of late and you guys are ready to go. Um, yeah, but I think we're more interested in hearing what you all have to say. Are you all connected? Yeah, yeah you can. Okay. Yeah. I've done the lights off. So let's get more. Okay. 
Okay, there you go. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, um, so, this is, so this is the code for the car. So um, generally what, what we've been doing so far for the last few weeks is learning everything we need to know to make the car not crash and to be able to like follow a wall again without crashing. So the first thing that we did was a bang bang controller, which is just like left, right, left, right, left, right, following a line. So from there, um, we started work on the proportional controllers, which checks how close it is to the wall before deciding on the angle that it wants. So, um, so we've got it running in gazebo here. This is basically, this is what we tested in when we don't want to test on the actual race car, either because it takes too much time or we're worried that it's just really not going to work. So this is the car, and um, the, the general error that it wants to follow is it wants to be one meter from the wall to its right. So um, I've set it about, about two meters in the simulation so that you guys can see it in action a little bit. And um, I if I were to zoom out, you would see it's, it's a big block with like a little bit of squiggly lines, and um, the general idea was to be able to get it to follow the entire wall and, um, and to have it eventually resolve to a straight line where it was moving along. So I run this. And, and while he's running that, Gazebo is actually a simulation environment that runs within uh, what's called ROS or a robot operating system, which is an open source standardized tool in academia um, that allows them to run this. Um, the, other, the other comment while this is running is there's recently been a few articles in the press where they've started to call into question the efforts by certain corporations to push certain types of proprietary agendas into state school curriculums. Um, this is kind of a pushback on that, in that mm -hmm. by partnering with academia and using open source standards, we teach kids the theory and concept, which then they can work with any programming language or learn the syntax. Right on. Yeah, so you can see up there, it's, it's about to turn a corner, which is never a good thing when something's going to be different. So, um, so, so what, the, what the code does is it checks within a certain range to its right, finds the closest thing, and then it takes that, divides it by two, and it uses that as its steering angle. I think I may have changed it to 2.5. But um, so, so, yeah, right here, originally it just checked one straight to its right, and it went straight past this corner, then freaked out and started turning a lot. So we've kind of got it going around there. Any, any other of you have any comments? Yeah, so yeah, so honestly, this is like a project within a project, like wrapped in maybe like a project, and then like a <laughs> maybe like sprinkling a little bit more project in there. <laughs> so uh, we're your op students, so like basically uh, we have the opportunity to work here for the summer. So we're working for Kurt, our he's our real boss. But <laughs> but then uh, we kind of we kind of came along with Ed and a lot of these kids like didn't know what programming was they never programmed they never learned Ross we actually I don't know if Kurt knew this but we actually did not know Ross until the week we started the year out so we're like a week ahead of these guys hence the project within a project but uh, yeah so a lot of these kids they came really far uh, like the skill level ranged a lot but like we were able to bring them together they worked with each other they worked with us and we were able to. Gonna do cool stuff like this, and hopefully, as we get closer to uh, August 5th, we can get them to compete in the car race, which will be really cool. So, one other thing to talk about Kurt also has a year off project for them that involves much more intensive use of either this car or something we're putting together. We're kicking around. The idea is to map one of the basements for some other project here, um, but down to a very small level, uh, into the millimeter level. Um, so we're looking at using, potentially clustering a, a handful of Jetsons together to get more computational power and then adding some additional LIDARs and uh, stuff like that. And some of these kids may work with these Europe students next month uh, along with us. So this has been a pretty busy month, uh, six weeks. This, this, this particular program, uh, I was told, said history in public education. It moved from uh, a handshake and a concept up here to uh, three and a half weeks later it was executed and, and Funded on its way, so um, we're hoping to keep that kind of momentum uh, going and uh, replicate it other places. <coughs> you guys have anything else you want to? No? It's just really a good opportunity to, for us to, for a lot of us to get initiative. <coughs> things that we really wouldn't be able to have time to do. Because I know, like, I have a million other things going on. If, if I didn't have this program going on, I wouldn't be able to find the time to learn all this different stuff. And it's you know, not, not something I'd have the time for in school or out of school or anything like that. 
So almost every bit of this project is public domain. If you go to racecar.mit.edu, yeah. there's links to yeah. code base, the lectures. Sure. There's, yeah. e there's even the uh, BeagleWorks Summer Institute. There's a YouTube channel. Uh, <coughs> BWSI.mit <laughs> or MIT. You know, Summer or YouTube. Um, and it, it really is. It, it's potentially going to push into into other schools. It's hopefully the scale. You know, on a national level. So there were, there were three students who ended up at MIT as TAs, and then there were other students coming in from the rest of the country. Is that so? The, it worked. The, the TAs were the TAs came first. The the MIT UROPs, these three guys right here. Uh, the Nauset Schools District folks were probably. I guess we were thinking about that maybe at the end of May as well. And then, and then the Mexican students are, are on the other end of this link that uh, yep. they have at NOS at schools, a, a video link. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we have a little demo if you guys want. We're going to take the car out and run some code that's actually going to be pushed to the car on the hall. It should drive straight, hopefully, right? Okay. Uh, well, it will, yeah, it will drive down the hallway. And it was actually created by, from scratch by uh, these students. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if you guys want to come out here, we can see, uh, yeah. you got the router out there? Uh, that's a okay. cable. It's going to reach? Thanks. Yeah. And it's turned out. I don't think anybody's going to the rest of you. There are only four people that are interested. Yeah, because, yeah, that's nice. I don't drop in. Yeah, yeah. I'll have yeah. a 20 and a 5. Can you break a 20? I think so. Oh my god. Oh my god. So this is how we're, we're getting this into places like Newtown Court, is because you go to the Pisani Center at Newtown Court and say, hey, resident with a window facing MIT, do you want a free computer? And it's like, this will do everything you want. It's got a library office on there. We're like, sure. And we're like, just make sure that that radio is on. And, and now all of a sudden we've got coverage. Newtown Court, Washington Homes, all these public housing areas. We basically got free rights away because we gave them a computer. So uh, this is so this is how the Cambridge Public Internet got started. Like okay. We had like eighty. So they basically have something that's a web browser and, and yeah, yeah. 
You're not giving them screens and keyboards. No, uh, but but some other group, Cambridge Housing Authority, is. So it turns out like HDMI monitors are like twenty five bucks to buy it through their program. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, who the fuck? My money would have been on VGA, but uh, hey, do I know? So TVs are still being made, and they're made cheaper and cheaper every day. <laughs> So, so it was kind of a good, perfect storm. I mean, the gal works at Cambridge Housing Authority that's an MIT grad. I said, hey, we've got all this gear left over from you know, Cambridge Public Internet. So, yeah, so, there's, so, so I'm psyched. Um, everything, so because Mozilla gave us a thousand panda boards, <laughs> literally. Seriously? Yes, like a thousand panda That's boards. a real supercomputer. <laughs> <laughs> On a complete fluke, it was like. Uh, just what were they doing with it? So, so this was their ARM uh, compile farm. Uh, so in the early days, there was nothing out there that you could buy in sufficient quantity to, to do your distro uh, okay. recursion and, and okay. Jenkins and all that, which was a non-trivial task. Sure. Um, uh, especially with all of the revisions, that, you know. Uh, uh, if you your yeah, builds. Yeah, all the builds. So, um, so they had, so they literally shipped us hmm. you know, maybe three pallets worth of servers, and uh, they all had, so this is what they look like inside. There are 12 of these per 4U server, and they shipped us, like I say, a couple hundred of these 4U servers. So, <laughs> what are you storing though? Well, well this, is, this, is a, <laughs> this was a huge problem. This was a huge problem. <laughs> yeah, it would so, be. So you always find yourself in this kind of they're all this, they're this fire engine red. And it's like, so I wasn't there when they showed up, which wasn't a good thing. If, if, I, had, if I had had them off at the, at the loading dock, it would have been one thing. But, um, uh, all right, yeah. so you have a lot so, of these. Yeah, well, now they've got, so I, I managed to, to send them a, a pallet's worth or two down to, to uh, Orleans. So part of them is, is their problem now. I still, <laughs> still have a pretty substantial problem. But, um, but what I can do is, so, so I'll, I'll give you like, like this, is, this is one full kit here. I won't give you this. Mm -hmm. The yes. only tricky bit with powering this thing is you can either do a five volt barrel connector of, of like really any amperage, but one amp, one amp and two amps, it, it's fine. Right. I've been powering them off a USB because I got like a thousand of those, oh, like those. Samsung Dopey, and those are all two amps. I was kind of surprised that Samsung would give you a two amp charger. But they definitely do. Um, it quite a few phones so will, will take. Oh, well, nowadays two amps, a lot of them will do two amps, amps. And maybe a little and bit maybe more, more via yeah. USB. There, but there but is a standard. But it needs it. two amps. No, it needs one amp. I know it needs more than, than spec USB. I think USB is 500. I think it is 500. Yeah. I appreciate it. Sure. No, I know I need. I've tried that. Actu actually, no. Uh, I th high power. Well, high. Oh right, a max the blue tab. It, it, the max, no, no, no. no, the, max, no, 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 no. the maximum power is a half amp. However, if you are, once you are fully up and talking to the host, you can ask for a half amp, right. but you are only guaranteed a tenth. Before you negotiate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But almost everybody does. Black almost for a uh, most yeah. will provide a half. So, uh, so I, I got a turnkey system for you and I got a turnkey system for okay. me. And, and, uh, um, and what I think you can do before September 1 is anything you want. Because I, I just really want to have uh, TTN coverage. And I don't think I need, if I need to capture some logs, maybe I'll ask you. But otherwise, I think you can screw around with it and do whatever you want with it. Because cause as you will see, and I don't know if I showed you, you turn this sucker on. And GPS packet. Right. So GPS packet forwarder just just launched. Uh, GPS packet. Yeah, see that right there. So so the only that, that's the low the oh. low RAM. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now you see it's been running for like a thousand hours or something. Like that. So I got that to start on boot, and that okay. is the only thing I care about because this will show up on the on the things network map if that there. Right. Because. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it, that, that one daemon is going to do the packet forwarding for this network. Yes. Now, and the really good bit is, if you decide not to connect to the internet, that's fine. It'll it'll route to the nearest LoRaWAN route. Okay. So, so, and that's really the only piece we care about is that we have 100% coverage, 900 megabits at, low, at the LoRaWAN. Okay. Yeah. We don't really give a shit about TCP. But if you wanted to plug it into the internet and use it in a web browser, I, I, I don't know what your own personal 
okay. you know, experiments might might okay. all that. Um, so uh, this is all USB 2.0. Yes. I assume. And then this goofy. I'm going to unplug it now just to show you. Because I, I have a powered hub that's 2.0, so I can I can do something like what you're doing. Yeah, here. or you could do a barrel connector. Right. And then, um, uh, and then so they're going to. So that out. HP computer, what did it have it's for really um, mid USB mid ports? Mid the three. Oh, so I figure it out. Okay. Usually these. Yes, I didn't say that the label is. USB crappy, three is usually um, a different color. Forty in one flash uh, USB reader, which takes these. So I have several cables. <laughs> <that I use. laughs> but yes, I. But but I know what the problem is. And I'm not sure where it's getting power from right now. Let's see. Maybe pull the power cord up. Maybe. The HDMI. Sure. still. This uh, no, this guy. Well, this okay, guy so could be USB, USB on the go. Right. <laughs> USB on the go. <laughs> so, so yes, yeah. the, the power over USB was running backwards. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. USB on the go. You know. Yeah. Yes. It's it's it's, uh, it's like I can plug in a, a USB controller. It's kind of like this. you know you know how you have home. Oh, either way. PoE versus home PNA. One of them is Ethernet over power. The other one's power over Ethernet. <laughs> If you got through the other, you get a perpetual washing machine. So let me. So yeah. So so that's got that's an eight gig SD card. These are these are dangerous. I'll send you the login and the password. So yeah. the the base. So so what's funny is since almost everybody on the planet has been has been DD and my disk. We've got the name and password for like every TTN router. Certainly in the United States. <laughs> possibly quite a few in the United States. Now it's got a static IP address because that's how it made Well, so only really this one works. This is DVID. Alright, never mind. Just so Avoid that connector. <laughs> Got it. Sure, uh, and, um, we got um, so basically, yeah. for our project, what we want is to uh, be uh, 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 yep. for Ross. Uh, uh, and this would be power in if I. That's 5 volt, yeah. Uh, uh, speaker out, my hand. For here. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then there's some other stuff on the board. I left it in this just because it's kind of easy to find. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, do you need this? Hang on. Okay. All right. So we need or I'll give you a for the barrel. I got a lot of the like this. I don't think this one's working, but I got lots of these surprise for the barrel. I wouldn't mind having it. All right, she has one. See if it works. This is the barrel. Yeah. All right. Yeah, this is a great one for you. No, I mean, it's an exciting process. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm concerned with because <laughs> with DC it matters where the polarity is. Like, we just had that conversation earlier. Check the green light. If the green light comes on, yeah, yeah. another one. Yeah. Yeah. And you can also pass it the dash. Yeah, no smoke. All right, the green light is on. Okay, so now in about five minutes it'll start. Okay, so now it's it's serving packages. Now, well, it would be if it actually. Yeah, and, 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 and we turn two hours and you turn that yeah. yeah. So like I said, it's eight days to get in the house. Even if you lock the out, you get to get in the house. That's a huge thing. Let me get you a thing. Consider yourself challenged. Yeah, that would be helpful. I didn't realize we were going to be here. Unless you lock it with a ballot. Here we go, power. There's a large car which I need to be careful. It is, yes, but I have a, yeah, uh, I got a briefing for you. That's why I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Like, maybe I want to take it out of the device yeah. while I'm moving it. Yeah. Um, so. so I'm actually, while I'm moving this, I'm thinking, do you have a box for this? I have a, do you have a, you need to have a bag or a box? I have the box. Uh, 
Well, yeah. So that well, I, I'm be thinking I, I might be able to get the antenna. Or something. I might be able to get the antenna to someplace I don't want to put the unit. Right. By using a long USB extender cable. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, is there a coverage map of where you? I mean, I'm trying to figure yeah. out. So you're almost my best line of sight. So I'm you basically yeah. in Porter Davis Square. So okay. I'm like on the edge of Cambridge. If you go to the Things Network. So that, and then, and then go to Boston. So the things network.org slash C slash Boston. You'll see the other team. Now I'm pretty sure I'm already getting at least up to Davis Square. So well then I'll be right in the middle. That's perfect. Because I I'm halfway between those eight. So you'll extend us probably past the highway or something. Could be. Yeah, yeah. If you think want, so. I live here. Yeah, so I'm going to build more of these. I only have two tonight. But, uh, I'll be happy to get it. Yeah, yeah. All right. I live right in the corner. And you got a lovely LXDE uh, GUI to, to log in. Yeah. You hit the carriage return, and it'll eventually get it. <laughs> right, yes. And I'll, 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 I'll carry a monitor up to my attic. <laughs> so I can. Uh, Right, right. But you said that's right. 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 Yes, that, that's what I figured. So, well, no, you guys, you guys are not so aware. Okay. Room sighting, slight room. Uh, I can put it near. Uh, I can make sure that the windows that it's near are not. So, so, you need so I got a lot of information on Kevin Gleason. 
getting a copy of the email. Kevin was looking for him earlier. That's why I sent him an email. What? For me? For us? No. Kurt was looking for him. Kevin actually built a supercomputer out of PSP. It's at Mount Ida. You might have even seen it. PSP, I mean the uh, PlayStation. Yeah. PlayStation. No, no, no. He built a supercomputer out of uh, boards on a uh, not PSP, but PVC. Oh, PVC. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah.